Well, if you don't drive, this might mean nothing to you. But the word gas station, two words, I guess. Gas station. If, you're, if you drive, if you have your own car, gas stations are one of the worst places in the world. They, they, they truthfully are. It, I hate going to the gas station. It's one of my worst favorite errands that I run in my life because every time I go to the gas station, I got to put my card into the machine and uh, I got to pay $100 now for my, for my big car to fill up that tank. So it's a, a Benjamin every time I want to go fill up my car with gas. And that is one of the, it feels like one of the worst ways to spend 100 bucks. Just straight up, I would rather spend it on a million other things in life than just filling up my car with gas. And uh, I have to do it every other week, every maybe 10 days or so, every uh, time that my car starts to uh, blink lights at me and say, hey, you're running low, I have to go drop 100 bucks, and it's not really fun. But now they're starting to make these high-tech cars, you know, you got the electric cars, you got Tesla and Rivians and stuff like that, where they go and they find these little plug-in places, and it's a lot cheaper than 100 bucks to fill up your quote-unquote gas tank or your electricity tank, if you will, um, in your Tesla or in your nice high-tech car. Um, but we've yet to come across, or at least from what I've heard of, yet to come across that a car that just self-sustains itself, that doesn't need to go plug in to one of these charging stations, doesn't need to go to the gas station and fill up with gas every week or every other week or something like that, where I, I just think I, whenever that car comes out, I would sign up to have that car. That would be great. I would love to have a car that I never need to go to the gas station. I never need to charge it up. I even hear just how frustrated it is when you have a nice Tesla and you have to, you're driving somewhere and you just have to stop and charge and wait there for like 30 minutes before you can get back on the road and go again. And I think how awesome would it be to have a car that you don't need to do any of that? The power is in and of itself. It charges itself all the time. You don't need to plug into anything external. You see, all weekend long we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, and that's exactly what we've said the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is like, the, if, the, if you will, the car that doesn't need any charging, the car that doesn't need to go to the gas station and swipe this card and pay 100 bucks to get some more gas in your tank. You have the power inside of you. Not inherently to you, it is external to you in terms of it is God living with inside of you. But the Holy Spirit lives inside of you where you don't need to go to the charging station, if you will, to go fill up because he's always within you. Today we're going to open up to John chapter, John chapter 14 to see how the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as the one that lives inside of you, helping you, charging you up, empowering you at all times. The power source, the battery, the gas tank, if you will, it's always full and it's always, it's always ready to go. You see that the Holy Spirit, we've talked about it the last couple of days, the Holy Spirit drags you to the point of repentance by convicting you of sin, showing you that you fall short of God's perfect standard. And then after that, after he convicts you, he brings you to the point of repentance, and then the Holy Spirit is the one that brings you new life, gives you new life. That is not you trying to manufacture something on your own, but it is the Holy Spirit coming with inside of you, giving you this brand new life that you don't deserve, that I don't deserve, and then that changes everything about you. But now if you are a Christian... If you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you're like that car that has the battery always charged. It's always self-sustaining, if you will, in terms of the Holy Spirit is always empowering you as you live. So we got to um, understand how we can tap into that power. Maybe you're sitting here as a Christian, you're thinking, okay, great. Well, I feel like my gas tank is empty. What do I do? I feel like something is wrong. Well, we got to depend on the Holy Spirit. We got to trust in the Holy Spirit. We got to walk by the Spirit and we got to uh, live by the Spirit and uh, trust the the power that is living inside of you if you are a Christian. John chapter 14, we referenced it a couple nights ago on uh, Friday night. But John chapter 14, we're going to look at verse 15 through 17. We'll start there. We'll drop down to verses 25 and 26 as well. But let's read John 14, verse 15 through 17 right now. Talk about the indwelt spirit that now is empowering you to live a uh, godly life. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, this is Jesus talking. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him. For you know him, because he dwells in you, and he or dwells with you, and will be in you. Look down at verse 25. It says, These things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. Verse 26. But the helper. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will now teach you and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
So we see Jesus, again, in a similar situation to where we were on Friday night, where he's about to leave his disciples, and he's going to, they're starting to freak out, thinking that they're going to be left all alone. He says, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit, and it's going to be better than just if I was standing next to you telling you what to do, because the Holy Spirit will be the battery pack, the charging station inside of you, giving you power to, to please God, giving you power to obey God. And we see that's kind of where he starts. We look back at verse 15. He says that if you love me, if you're a Christian, you're going to keep my commandments. You're going to do what I say. Jesus is addressing just the, the necessity of obedience for the life of a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you have been born again, if you have a new self that now living inside of you, you are expected to obey God. He says straight up, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will obey me if you are a Christian. Not perfectly, but you're going to need help to obey God. Because if anyone in this room has tried to obey God, it is a hard thing to do. It's hard thing to do. It's hard to say no to sin. It's hard to do the right thing at all times. It's hard to share the gospel with someone at school. It's hard to obey God. It's hard to read your Bible oftentimes. It's hard to pray sometimes. So what, what do I do? There, there's, is there something wrong with me? No, there's not something wrong with you. You, you need to depend upon the helper. Someone that is different than you. Someone that is in, living inside of you. That you have to submit to. That you have to utilize their help. And if you think... Back to last night, we talked about Nicodemus in John chapter 3, who was doing a lot of good things in order to please God. Doing a lot of good things, thinking that those good things earned something with his relationship with God. And really what he had to explain to Nicodemus last night is that you can't do it on your own. We we looked at John 3, uh, verse 6. I love the way they put it. It said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Basically, you trying to manufacture something on your own, it's always going to be flesh. You're always going to fail. You're always going to go back over and over and over and over again into sin. But you need something different. And again, if God has laid out an expectation for you as a Christian, says that you have to say no to sin, and you have to say yes to righteousness, you are going to need help to do it. You're going to need to utilize the helper that now lives inside of you to be able to do that. You can write it down this way for point number one. Utilize the help of the helper. Utilize the help of the helper. Simple as that. You've got the third member of the Trinity living inside of you. Jesus calls him here in our text the, the helper. The one who's going to come alongside you. To empower you. To comfort you. To be with you. He calls them the, the helper. If you're doing another, if I was going to teach you another Greek word, I'd probably teach you this one. It's a really helpful one. I'll show it up on the screen. But this pit, the word helper, that's not really a, a, a great translation in terms of it doesn't really communicate what's going on with this word. But the word here is, is called the helper. It's, the, it's called the uh, parakletos. Oftentimes they'll refer to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. Two, two words, compound word, para, kletos. Para is this picture of alongside of. It's a preposition, so think of just, yeah, all of your prepositions, something to come alongside of something else. And then kletos means to be called or the one who was called. And so the Holy Spirit, the great word picture of what the Holy Spirit is, is he's the called alongside one. He, he comes alongside of you, and our ESV will translate it helper. Maybe if you have a different Bible translation, it will translate it comforter, or it will translate it uh, counselor, or it will translate it advocate. But I think that's a really helpful word picture there on the screen. Parakletos, he comes alongside you. Oftentimes I've illustrated just that word picture with a crutch. You think of when you break your leg, you've got crutches under both armpits, keeping you up, supporting you, coming alongside you to, to keep you standing up. To strengthen you so that you cannot, so that you don't, you know, fall down in that sense. And so we see the Holy Spirit, He now comes inside of us and He comes with us forever. Look back at our text, verse 16. He says, I'll ask the Father, He will give you the paracletos, He will give you the helper, the one who's going to come alongside you to comfort you, to counsel you, and He will be with you forever. If you're a Christian, you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit forever, living inside you forever. So when you come to camp, it seems like you, know, you might be excited about spiritual things, and you might think about, oh man, I want to please God. That's great. That's awesome. But you have to understand, if you are a Christian, you are a Christian forever. You can't back out when life gets hard. You can't say, oh, I'm going to just give up in two weeks when it's difficult. There's this aspect of permanency, a covenant, if you will. You 
and the Paracletos, you and the Holy Spirit, you and the Pneuma, where you are now connected, it says forever. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians 1, it will be on the screen, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, describes this permanent relationship you have with the Holy Spirit. He says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed in him, you were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. There's this aspect of sealing. There's this aspect of permanence. You think of like a, like a down payment. Uh, like you're going to buy a house, you're going to buy a car, something like that. You put money down to, make, to prove to the bank that you're going to pay off the rest. You put down a big chunk of change and you say, I'm going to promise to pay the rest. The Holy Spirit is like the big chunk of change, if you will, where it, it, it commits you forever. You're stuck in this relationship forever. Stuck, that's the, the negative connotation. But you get to be a part of this relationship forever. You can't walk away from it. Remember, my old youth pastor used to describe it when we would go away to camp. He would say, I, I, he would always say, I wish at one of these camps I could just come up and I could marry two people at camp. And I'll just send you home as a married couple from camp. And, you know, I just remember being a high school student or junior high student and thinking, oh, wow, that's, that'd be interesting, you know. Hey, mom, hey, mom, guess what, I'm married. And you think that'll, that conversation with your mom uh, or your dad when you show up and you get back to church, you say, hey, uh, I got married this weekend. Pastor Matt, you married me up there, and here's my wedding ring, and we're done. Here we go. For the rest of our life, we're married. Probably your parents would, first of all, say you're crazy, and second of all, say, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because I don't think you do. When you get married, you are married for the rest of your life. This is a permanent relationship. And see, if you are here and you're saying, I'm a Christian, you are saying, I am married and I'm never getting divorced. From God. I will be with him forever. I will walk with him forever because the Holy Spirit is now living inside of me. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just pick up and leave. The Holy Spirit is a ceiling, is the down payment to, to prove, to, to guarantee. Ephesians 1 says, to guarantee our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. You see this Holy Spirit take up a residence inside the believer. If you look back at our text, verse 17. Again, who is the Holy Spirit? He's the, verse 17, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. Again, there's that picture of the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of unbelievers in terms of convicting them, but he doesn't live inside of them, only believers. And he says, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He now takes up residence inside the believer. He's not just convicting you from the outside, but he's living inside of you forever. You can write down uh, 1 Corinthians Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, describes the picture of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He said, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price, so now glorify God in your body. This picture of the Holy Spirit living inside of you is like the picture uh, of the Old Testament, uh, of, the, of the temple that they had in Jerusalem. You see that on the screen? The picture of the temple... See that middle area in there where you got like the, kind of those weird creatures right there in the middle? That was called the Holy of Holies, where God's presence literally dwelled. And then if you remember the story, when Jesus dies on the cross, when, it, when he says he breathes his last, there was a great earthquake, darkness fell over the land, and then on the left side of the screen, the temple, that veil that protected the presence of God from the rest of the temple, it tore in two. And there was this picture of when Jesus died, now we have access to God through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, to the Father. We have a relationship with God. And again, the, back in the Old Testament, they were very, very strict with how they treated the temple. They were very strict with purification rituals and sacrifices before they could go in. And only one time a year, only one time a year, the high priest would go into that middle section, that little... Uh, little room in the middle where God's presence dwelled, only one time a year could they go in God's presence. And what they would do, they would, again, do lots of ceremonial things. They would change all their clothes and wear all their, you know, clean garments and jewelry and all that kind of stuff. And one of the details that they would say, what they would have to do with these priests, is they would wrap a, a, a rope around their ankle 
so that if they walk into the temple and God strikes them down because of God's holiness and they're unholy, if God kills them, then no one else has to go into the temple and they can just bring, they can pull out the corpse with just the rope because they, they view God so highly. They view God as so different. The presence of God was in this room over here. If I said that in that room over there, God was right in there, you, it would be, whoa. But you see, this text says God doesn't dwell in one of these right here. He dwells inside of you if you're a Christian. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Maybe here people use that, that verse wrongly. Again, as John was just praying, that people have very wrong views of the Holy Spirit. One of the wrong views of the Holy Spirit is they read this verse and say, your body's a temple, and they talk about eating good food or working out or exercising or anything like that. Well, look at the punchline of this text. Verse 20. If you can go back to the last slide and you see the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, you were bought with a price. Or he says, first of all, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, so now glorify God in your body. Now, if you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, your expectation is now for the rest of your life to glorify God. And again, that sounds scary. That sounds hard. That sounds difficult. But remember, you have God living inside of you. The Holy Spirit living inside of you, empowering you, helping you taking up residence inside of your heart. You just think about how serious you would take some celebrity, some famous person, if they said, hey, I'm going to come to your house for dinner tonight. You would probably take that pretty seriously. You would go clean your room. You would go help your mom set the table. You would go put out all your nice, I don't know, nice things, I guess, outside, and you just clean everything up to make it look as beautiful as possible because there's a famous person, there's someone that I think is important, they're going to come in and have dinner with me tonight. You have the most famous person, if you will, in the world, God himself, not taking up residence in your home and having dinner with you, but living inside of you. Do you feel the weight of that? Do you see how big of a deal that is? Again, they were so afraid of God back in the Old Testament that they put a rope around these people's ankle just in case God killed them because they were in the presence of God. If you're a Christian, God has given you new life and then taken up residence inside you to help you, to empower you, to glorify God. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You are about the Christ Son. Glorify God in your body. So how do you practically do that? How do we practically tap into the help that the Helper gives us? Well, even our text, if you look down at verse 18, he kind of gives a picture of one of the things that the Holy Spirit helps us with. You can write it down to the first sub-point. It is his, his comfort. The Holy Spirit helps us by, by comforting us, by being there with us. Look at verse 18. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. If you drop your eyes down in verse 27 in John 14, verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you, not as the world gives you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. If God is with you, if God is living inside you, what greater comfort is there in the world? You're never alone. He describes it, you're, you're not an orphan, you're not left on your own. And what makes an orphan so sad is that an orphan has been left by their family, by their parents, whether by death or just abandonment or something like that. And in an orphan, they, no one is there to love them. They're all alone. They're sitting there going, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Who is going to take care of me? This text says, you're not an orphan if you're a Christian. Because God is with you. God is inside you, giving you, verse 27, there's this peace that he gives to you. In, in one sense, you have this peace with God. We talked about it yesterday, that you are at war with God, you are dead in your sins, and now Jesus, now the Holy Spirit has now brought you peace where your relationship with God is fixed, but then also you have peace in, within the crazy circumstances of life. If the Holy Spirit is living inside you, God is with you at all times, even when life is scary and difficult. We read on Psalm uh, 34, Psalm 34, 18. It says, the Lord is near to the broken heart and, and saves the crushed in spirit. You can also write down uh, Philippians 4, verse 7. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When life is scary, when life is difficult, remember this, that the helper is with you. The helper lives inside of you. He's never leaving you. You're not an orphan. You're not off on your own. 
Turn to God for comfort. Don't turn anywhere else. Turn to the Helper. Cry not to the Helper. Asking the Helper for comfort. For the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's one of the ways that the Helper helps you. How else can you utilize the Helper's help? Well, another incredible gift of the Holy Spirit indwelling within you is that the Holy Spirit now gives you assurance that you are a real Christian. You write that down to the second sub-point. It's his assurance. His assurance. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. Romans 8, verses 15 through 17 gives us a great picture of the comfort, the comfort that you can have, that you that you can know for 100 percent certainty that you are a Christian, that when you die, you will not experience the wrath of God. Romans 8, 15 through 17. He says, uh, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So now, the spirit has now come in, into your life, so now you have a relationship with God. You can cry out, Abba, Father. You have a relationship with God. Verse 16, it says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit, so capital S spirit, Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit, lowercase s, in terms of who you are, your inner personal inner being, that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. The Spirit accomplishes your adoption as a son. Again, going back to last time, you were an enemy of God, dead in your sin, and now through what Jesus did on the cross for you, you can now be called, go from enemy to son. An enemy to a son. Or a daughter. That is a, an incredible Switch of identities there. So you now have a relationship with God in terms of this family relationship. You have the Spirit who is now with you forever, Jesus says. And now it says that the Spirit himself bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. It says you are an heir of God. What is an heir? An heir is someone that is going to, at some point in time, receive some inheritance. Right? You're waiting for... You know, grandparents or parents die, and, and there's this inheritance that now comes to you because of your identity, because of who you are. If you're a Christian, you are an heir of God in terms of you are looking forward to what God is going to give you in the next life. It says to, to be glorified by Him. If you think about you and you know you're a son or a daughter and you have an inheritance from your parents, you don't have to sit there at night and say, I wonder, I wonder if it's going to be me. I wonder if I'm going to get the inheritance or if my friend across the street is going to get it. Or, you know, that other person that I just met at the supermarket today. Or the person I saw at the gas station. No, if, if, if your son or daughter, if your dad or parents or grandparents or whatever with an inheritance, you know I, that's going to come to, to me. I know I'm going to have that. Not the other person over there. It, it's mine because I'm the, I'm the heir. I'm the son or the daughter. And if you're a Christian, you can have 100% assurance that you are a Christian. Again, we'll talk about that here in a couple minutes. But what that, how that actually plays out. Like, how do you, how do you really know? What, what, what signs can you see? Okay, we'll talk about the fruit of the Spirit, but the Holy Spirit gives certainty to you. Lastly, another one of the ways that the Holy Spirit helps you is subpoint. Subpoint C is his, his intercession. His intercession. Intercession, fancy way to say he's going on your behalf to God. Romans chapter 8, great picture of this in, in terms of prayer. The, the relationship you have to God through the Holy Spirit through prayer. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, for the Spirit himself intercedes for us, groaning too deep for words. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I don't know if you've ever gotten to that point before. I know I have. You're sitting there. You've gone through something traumatic in your life. You don't know what, what's going on. You don't know which way is up. And you're sitting there and you say, I need to pray, but I have no idea what to pray. I, I, I just know life hurts. I know this situation that I'm dealing with. This is crazy. I don't even know what to pray right now. This verse tells you that if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, he's interceding on your behalf. Think of the Holy Spirit as, as an editor. It, again, you're praying and he's there editing your prayers to make sure that it is in accordance with the will of God. 
verse 27. Interceding for the saints according to the will of God. Why? Because he searches hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit, because he lives inside you, he knows you. don't even know what to pray in this situation. It says there's this picture of this groaning too deep for words, the Spirit is there helping us in our weakness. I always hated turning in essays in school. I'm sure you probably do too. Because you put in a lot of effort, right, to these essays. You put in a lot of time, a lot of thought, outlines and transitions and hooks and quotes and all that kind of stuff. You spend a lot of time and effort in your essays, and then you turn it in, and your teacher says, nah, I don't like it. Yeah, I hate that feeling. When you're like, I, they don't even know, I worked so hard on that paper, and they're just like, ah, see, sorry, loser. It's like, that's not a good feeling. That's not a good feeling. And oftentimes, when you turn in a paper, you have no, sometimes, I mean, sometimes you know, sometimes you don't know. I have no idea if this is going to get a good grade or not. I really have no clue. Because the teacher takes the paper and then grades it themselves. Picture the Holy Spirit. It's like it's like you turning in a paper, the teacher editing the paper for you, and then grading it after they rewrite it. Imagine if your teacher wrote all your essays. What kind of grade would you get on all your essays? 100% every time, right? Because the teacher knows what the teacher wants. And so if the teacher was writing your essays for you, you'd have straight A's. You'd, have, you'd get A pluses on every paper you ever write. Because the teacher is there editing the paper for you. Again, that's the picture of the Holy Spirit, editing our, our prayers on our behalf, interceding. Because he knows us and he knows God because he, he is God. Again, there's so many different pictures, especially in the New Testament, of the other ways that the Holy Spirit helps us, but those are the only three we really have time for before we have to move on. I love that picture of the helper, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside us, comforting, assuring, interceding on our behalf. The helper, got to tap into his, his help. But because the Holy Spirit is your helper, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are the boss, right? Typically, you think of someone helping you, it's someone lower than you trying to help you do something, push you farther. The Holy Spirit, he's way above you because he's God. So therefore, he's helping you, but at the same time, you are also subservient to him. You are also under his authority. You also have to submit to him because he's the boss. Right now, let's wait for point number two. Point number two, submit to the Holy Spirit's lead. Submit to the Holy Spirit's lead. Again, yeah, he helps you. Yeah, he comforts you. Yeah, he intercedes on your behalf, but he also is the one calling the shots in your life. And you have to submit to him each and every day. You're doing right on that point down. You write down Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians 5, verse 18. I love this, this picture here, this illustrative picture of what we're supposed to do as Christians. It says, uh, Ephesians 5, 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Instead of being intoxicated with something like alcohol, it, this verse is telling you, you need to be intoxicated by the Holy Spirit. You think of what is intoxication. You are Oftentimes they use this term in a, legal sense, in a legal sense. You are under the influence of a drug. You are not your full self because you are have taken a drug or something like that. Not you, hopefully. This is a hypothetical. And you are now under the influence of something else. The same picture of the Holy Spirit. You are under the influence of the Holy Spirit. This verse is telling you, get intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. Where he's now calling the shots. You are now sensitive to what he wants you to do, what he is prompting you to do, what he is leading you to do. Then that's something that you all of us need to be growing in at all times, growing in our sensitivity to where the Spirit is guiding us and leading us. And again, going back to session one, the Holy Spirit never leads you in a direction that is apart from God's word. He never leads you into sin, he never leads you to something that God has not already explicitly stated in his word of where you should go. But you got to be, if you're a Christian, very sensitive to where the Holy Spirit is leading you. Again, that means you, you are aware of conviction. That means you are aware of temptation. That means you are aware of how to put off and put on good works. God 
to respond to the Holy Spirit's prompting in your life, what are different ways you can do that? Well, our text plays it out, verse 26. Verse 25 and 26, rather. John chapter 14. It says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. Verse 26. But the Helper, the Parakletos, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will now teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I have said to you. first way that you can submit to the Holy Spirit's lead is by simply just remembering God's Word. Simply remembering God's Word. You write that down for the first step point. So it's the Holy Spirit by remembering God's Word. The Holy Spirit, one of His roles is to help teach you, help remind you of what Jesus has done. Again, it's very specific to that context in terms of he was talking to his apostles who were going to write different books of the Bible, so they were definitely attuned to the Holy Spirit's leading. They were writing this, writing uh, the books of the New Testament with the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 21, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So in a very real sense, we saw this take place in terms of the Holy Spirit writing the pages of the New Testament, prompted by the Holy Spirit, inspiring the text that we have in front of us. Then also, as a Christian here in 2022, he also prompts you and reminds you and instructs you of what Jesus has already done. We talk about this a lot when we talk about Bible reading, but one of the the expectations for you if you were going to read the Bible as a Christian is that you meditate on God's Word. Meditating. Picture of like chewing gum over and over and over and over again. And your leaders, me, we, we push you to read the Bible a lot. Do it, do it, do it. Read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. And that's good. We want you to read it, but we don't want you to just read it, close it, and forget about it. We want you to read it, get it into your mind like putting gum in your mouth so that you can chew on it for a long time. Again, the Holy Spirit, one of the roles that he has is bringing those things to your mind. Giving you gum, if you will, to chew on. Reminding you something that you've read. Maybe you're sitting here and you say, well, wait a minute. One of my things is I forget what I read all the time. I'm a really bad reader. I have a really short memory. and I read in the morning, and then by about second period, I've already forgot what I read in the morning. So is that the Holy Spirit's fault, or is that my fault? I'll tell you, that's, well, if you're a Christian, that's, that's your fault. That's your fault in terms of you have to make sure that you give the Holy Spirit gum, if you will, give the Holy Spirit ammo to now remind you to think of what you've read. Again, if you're just sitting there in the morning and you just glaze over your Bible reading and just say, oh, whatever, I'm just going to get through it. I just got to check a box and do it because I have to do it. What good is that? Are you going to get anything out of it? Are you going to have anything to chew on throughout the day? There's an aspect of the Holy Spirit reminding you, but then also the Holy Spirit just doesn't just sit there and bring verses that you've never read to mind either. You just, oh, wow. You know, man, you're just sitting there one day in class, you start thinking about some like very theological thing that you've never even thought about before. You've never even studied, you've never even read that verse before, but oh, that verse popped out of nowhere in your head. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit brings to mind what you have been reading, what the ammo, if you will, that you've put in the tank. So in one sense, the Holy Spirit is the one reminding you, but then in the other sense, you are the one actively trying to read attentively, trying to remember intentionally so that you can go out and apply God's Word. Maybe the goal for you as you leave camp is just, I need to change the way I read my Bible. I need to read and meditate on it. I need to chew on it like it's a piece of gum over and over and over again. When you do that, the Holy Spirit does His job reminding you of what God's Word says, reminding you of what Jesus taught, reminding you how to live. Submit by remembering God's Word. It starts with you first getting in God's Word, so maybe that's a good conversation to have in your small group, starting there. But after you do that, you've got to remember it. The Holy Spirit helps you do that. The next way that you can submit to the Spirit, it's not in our text, but it's in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17, describes the way that you submit to the Spirit is by killing your sin. By killing your sin. Write that down for the second sub point. By killing your sin. That's another way you can submit to the Spirit. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, describes this battle that you are in between the Holy Spirit and the flesh, the sinful cravings that you have. So you've got this battle going on, and what to do to say no to temptation, what to do to say no to sin, you've got to submit to the Spirit. Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these things are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that which you want to do. If you are a Christian, you will still battle sin. Hopefully you don't get that wrong from this camp, that when you become a Christian, you don't sin anymore. That you are going to sin as a Christian, but it's a very different kind of sin. You are not actively, habitually living in it, stuck in it, just going over and over and over and over and over again to it. But you're finding victory over it because of a verse like this, that you have the Spirit, you walk by the Spirit. And look at verse 16, look at the promise that is right here. It says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You will not gratify. That is a promise. If you walk by the Spirit. Verse 17 shows this picture of flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit, how these things are opposed to each other. Therefore, you need to walk by the spirit. What does that mean? I mean, be fully submitted, fully empowered by the Holy Spirit to obey God. You're thinking, you're meditating, just like we talked about the picture of remembering. How are you going to obey God's word when you don't even know God's word, when you forget what it says? You have to first remember, and then that it is the ammo, if you will, to then therefore put it into practice, walking by the Spirit. And if you walk by the Spirit, if you depend on the helper that lives inside of you, there's this promise that you will find victory over the flesh. You will, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Again, it's two very different pictures of you trying to go home from camp and saying, you know what, I'm just going to really try to stop lying when I get home. I'm going to try to just stop sinning. Versus you every day falling on your knees and saying, Holy Spirit, please help me. Help me be truthful. Help me put off sin. Help me not gratify the desires of my flesh. Help me turn away from sin. Help me see temptation and run away from it. Again, it's not a try harder, do better. It's a depend on the Spirit to, to help you do that. Right now, you've got to think, what sin do you have in your life? Maybe you've tried on your own willpower to stop. Maybe in small groups, you spend a lot of time setting half-hearted goals that you're not really intended on actually falling through with. You just say it because you think your leader wants to hear it. What good is that? What good is that? It's not a try harder or do better. It's a depend on the Holy Spirit. It's a walk by the Spirit. How do you practically do that? Drop your eyes down, or I guess you're on the screen at this point. A couple verses later in Galatians chapter 5. Do you know this text? Fruit of the Spirit. Right down to the third sub point is by, by bearing fruit. Submit to the Holy Spirit by bearing fruit in your life. Fruit of the Spirit. And I know you know this one. You know the song. You've got the song memorized stuck in your head right there. Fruit of the Spirit. you got the fruit. Yeah, yeah. Fruit of the Spirit. You've got all the stuff. You're welcome. You're welcome. What are the fruit of the Spirit? Not just love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. But the fruit of the Spirit. Look at this text. Look at this text. Next slide. So we stop that. Next slide. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have now crucified the flesh with its passions. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. How do we live by the Spirit? We put on the fruit of the Spirit. How do you say no to sin? How do you stop uh, being rude? How do you stop um, giving attitude to your parents? How do you stop cheating in school? How do you stop lying to your friends? You put on the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What is fruit? Fruit is this outward indicator that you have a real genuine relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, when he comes into your life, you are a completely changed person. And maybe you look up at that list right there, the fruit of the Spirit, and you think, wow, some of those I kind of am, and some of those not so much. Is that an excuse? Is that an excuse? Because we just read a couple minutes ago that if you have the Spirit, if you're a real Christian, those start to show up in your life. Are they difficult to put on? Is it hard to love people? Is it hard to be patient? Is it hard to have self-control? Yeah, it is. But you're finding victory. You're putting those things on. Again, these things here, these attributes, these characteristics are not are not just you trying to manufacture something, but it's what the Holy Spirit is doing inside of you. Which means your parents can see that. You know, this afternoon, you say, hey, Mom, Dad, do you see fruit of the Spirit in my life? Your siblings should be able to see it. Your friends should be able to see it. Your teachers should be able to see it. Your classmates should be able to see it. Your small group leaders should be able to see it. If you're a real Christian. These will start showing up in your life doesn't mean that they show up passively where you're just sitting there and one day you're just, wow, you're the most loving person in the world. No, you have to try, you have to put effort into it, but the Holy Spirit is the one causing you to love, causing you to have joy, causing you to have peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Oh, but these fruit of the Spirit, though, they're not my personality. I'm not really a patient person. Kind of an impatient person. I get frustrated easy, so that's just... That's not me. Maybe the kindness one, maybe the gentleness one, but I'm not patient. Is there such thing as an impatient Christian? Is there such thing as an unloving Christian? How about someone that's been changed by the Spirit, but yet they're not peaceful? A very unkind Christian? An unfaithful Christian? No. These aren't just personality traits. Going back to last night, they are your new self. Old self, new self. Oh, I'm not a patient person. Oh, well, looks like you have something to work on then, if you're a Christian. Looks like there's something that you need to put to death in your life, anger, and you need to put on patience. Again, this is not just cleaning up your life. This is the Holy Spirit doing it for you, invading your life, and you will never be the same. Comforting you when you're weak, interceding on your behalf and your prayers, giving you assurance that you're a real Christian, but then also strengthening you and empowering you to glorify God. For you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, so now glorify God in your body. You go down the mountain this afternoon, just remember that. Glorify God in your body. If you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, if He lives inside of you, it'll be very obvious. Is it hard? Absolutely. But if you walk away from this camp and forget legitimately everything, I want you to remember this one thing. If you forget everything else about camp, I want you to remember this, that you can't do it. You can't do it. You can't please God. You can't earn salvation. You can't fix your sin problem. You can't just, with your own willpower, just try to grit your teeth and put on fruit of the Spirit. You can't do it. You can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to do it inside of you. You're a failure. You're a loser. The Holy Spirit comes inside of you to fix that, to change that. To empower you to say no to sin. To give you the opportunity to please God. To fix your sin problem. Going back to that picture last week of that broken window. You cannot fix it on your own. You need someone to fix it for you. And then after he fixes it, now he's in your life empowering you, if you will, to not do it again. To protect yourself from doing it again. You can't do it. You need the spirit, the pneuma, the paraclete, whatever word you want to use. You need God's spirit living inside of you, empowering you. To please God, to glorify God. For your temple of the Holy Spirit. So now glorify God in your body. Let's do that as we go on from camp. This afternoon, God, God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to study your word, to hop into texts that might be unfamiliar to us, texts that sound a little weird. But God, 
we're grateful for the promises here in John chapter 14, John chapter 16, John chapter 3. God, that you sent your own self in terms of the third member of the Trinity to now live inside of us, to strengthen us, to comfort us, to empower us, to please you and to honor you and to live lives that glorify you. God, I pray for every Christian in this room, for every person in this room that their body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. God, may you strengthen them right now. God, get them excited right now to live for you, Get them excited to obey you. Get them excited to please you. Strengthen them so that they can say no to their sin and say yes to righteousness. But God, I do also pray for every student in this room that's not a temple of the Holy Spirit, that has no relationship with the Holy Spirit outside of the convicting nature of the Holy Spirit, that do not have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. God, I pray that you would open their eyes. God, pushing off the conviction that they have all weekend, hiding behind weak, watered-down answers in small groups, hiding behind excuses that they don't know enough, hiding behind the fear of losing friends, hiding behind the fear of not really being able to say no to sin, hiding behind the, just the idolatrous desire to love their sin rather than love you. God, open their eyes to show them they are walking down a path way to destruction. God, convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God, give them new life and empower them to live for you. That is what you call us to do, so please help us do that. Now we pray all these things in Jesus' name.